So our scripture this reading, as I mentioned, is from John chapter 2. Uh, maybe a familiar passage to you, the first miracle we have recorded, and uh, an important miracle in the life of John and his disciples. The turning of the water into wine at the wedding in Cana, John chapter 2, <coughs> verses 1 through 11. Let me read these verses uh, with you this afternoon. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why, are you, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, <coughs> do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Uh, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs, through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. There's our reading from God's holy word. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, summer is the, uh, is the time of, of weddings and those kinds of uh, celebrations. I can remember a, a wedding that I officiated uh, not too many years ago uh, on the West Coast. And if you've been to the West Coast at all, you know anything about the weather patterns out there, there's a lot of rain. But uh, disappointingly, there's not a lot of, of thunderstorms. Um, so... You get a lot of drizzle, but not a lot of the uh, excitement that I enjoy around here with the big thunderstorms. And um, right after, during this particular wedding, right after the bride and groom had made their vows, lo and behold, the, the loudest thunder strike that we had ever heard there, it seemed like at least, uh, just kind of shook the building. And uh, part of the surprise was we're just not used to thunderstorms. It kind of came out of nowhere, and it just kind of seemed to fit with the significance, you know, during the ceremony of those, of those vows. There's kind of a thunderous nature to those vows. With all the pomp and circumstance of things we enjoy about the weddings, you know, right at the center is a man or a woman before God and before these witnesses making certain important biblical vows to one another for that day and from that day on. Well, here is Jesus, and he, he chooses at this wedding that he and his disciples and his mom are invited to, to really reveal who he is and perform this miraculous sign, this amazing sign, so that, as we see as our theme here this, this afternoon, so that they would see his glory. They would see that he is more than just a carpenter's son, more than just a 30-year-old man in the community, rabbi perhaps, more than that, and that following the sign, they would understand who he was and they would believe on him. So just a couple points here as we look at this, a couple of identifiers in this text in terms of who Jesus is. First of all, He's the master of the feast. We might say he's the true master of this feast. And secondly, he's the bridegroom of the bride. He's the bridegroom of his, uh, his church. So first of all, Jesus is the master of, of the feast. And what I think 
jumps off the page with all that you might know about some of the other miracles Jesus does through his ministry, including feeding 5,000 people on one occasion, 4,000 on another occasion. I mean, he told Lazarus, come out of the tomb, and Lazarus came out. And all of the healings, the casting out of demons, but he chose this particular miracle as the first sign to his disciples so they would see his glory and they would believe on him. The first sign of who he actually was. If you know anything about the gospel stories, it took people a long time to realize who he was. Not just a rabbi, not a savior who was about to you know, ascend to a throne in, uh, in Rome as king over, over Israel and over the world, but as the suffering servant who had come to give his life away. And he chooses a wedding. And this very interesting miracle where most people would not have noticed at the time what he had done. Some people knew, the servants knew, that it was supposed to be water in those jars, but it had turned into wine. And disciples found out, and no, no doubt others found out as well. This is the moment where he steps onto the stage and encourages those we're following him to understand who he is and to believe and trust in him and see, see his glory. Now, we, might, we can talk about some of the details, you know, of that time where it was a serious thing for the master of the house to run out of wine. It was an embarrassment for the master of the house. It was an embarrassment for the bridegroom and his family and just for the start of their wedding, their celebration, the celebration that could last for a week or two weeks, a little different from our one-day celebrations uh, today. Uh, a serious kind of breach of etiquette that so people would remember uh, that the wine ran out. It might be a little bit like your guests, say you had 200 guests at a wedding, and, and uh, on the menu was filet mignon, and so people are receiving their, their food at the table with all the fixings and everything, or you're going up to, uh, you know, to... Uh, a table to get your food, but the filet mignon runs out, so the last hundred receive hot dogs instead of filet mignon. That's a little bit, a little sense of the embarrassment and sense of, of offense even if this would, would happen. But still, I mean, by this miracle, he manifested his glory. I mean, he just made sure there was wine to last the entire week or two weeks and he saved the, the master of the banquet of the bridegroom some embarrassment. How is this the opportune moments for Jesus to demonstrate his glory? Well, the important thing is that Mary noticed, and uh, his 12 disciples noticed, and no doubt others also began to take note of just who he was. And this is all in preparation for why he had come. So there's something really important here about what Jesus is doing. He's, he's more. He's doing something creational here, right? He's taking water and changing its form into wine. Now, water is important back then, but wine is even more important. Not just for, uh, not just for something to drink, but for celebration. Uh, even up to our our present day. He's the, he's the true master of this feast. He's the true master of what he has come to accomplish. What the whole Old Testament was pointing to. He's the master of this, of this plan. There's this master of the feast who is so excited uh, when this wine comes out. and He, he uh, compliments the bridegroom because Usually you serve the good wine first. And people have a little more discernment in terms of what they're drinking a little later on. And uh, people, are, uh, people are a little more filled. They might not quite notice the, the vintage or the quality of wine. So you serve the cheap stuff. He, he noticed this, this wedding feast has not just been saved, but it's getting more and more special. <laughs> The one who has come is, is no rabbi, it's no mere healer, it's not a, simply a teacher, it's not 
a prophet. He's not a prophet. He's not Elijah come back again. He's the Messiah. He's the one the people of God have, have been waiting for. He was the one already broadcast about in the Garden of Eden. When everything looked dark and everything seemed like it would fall apart, and God said, no, someone's coming. The seed of the woman's coming to save this whole mess. And he's here. He's the master of the feast. He's the master of everything that God determined to do. Everything, every man or woman of faith has been looking forward to. He's here. When I think of a feast, I think back to the beginning when everything was right. When God looked at everything he had made and, and behold, it was very good. And, and in the garden, there was this one tree they couldn't eat from, but there were hundreds and hundreds of trees they could eat from, including the tree of life. And the garden was just this place of just like abundant food. And their bodies were totally healthy. There was nothing sinful, nothing broken, no diseases, no threats like that. And um, it was a place of continual feast. You enjoyed God, you enjoyed uh, each other, and you enjoyed food. And, and that enjoyment was, was tweaked and was defiled by the, the fall into, into sin. And, and Jesus has come now to restore that. Everything that was, was spoiled, and even the good things that were now, now it, now it always had a vein of sickness and sin running through it. Even the best times that we can enjoy have something wrong with them, because, because we live in a sinful world and we're sinful. Now Jesus has come to make things right, to turn what is broken uh, into something new again, to restore what was lost. We have some marvelous prophecies, for example, in, in Isaiah 25 that I'd like to call your attention to. Isaiah, that absolutely astounding prophecy of what God is doing. For example, in 25, verse 6, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. Some great things that God did among his people, but this is the best. Now the, the true and best wine is here. Verses 8 and 9. He's going to swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Jesus knew those texts. And he purposely, at this wedding, chooses to reveal himself by turning water into wine so the feast can go on. And so the feast and the enjoyment and the celebration here, just pictured in this, in this wedding, this human ceremony, could get better and better and better. He saves the wedding. He's the true master of the feast. And prophesied in Isaiah. And now if you carry that all the way through to the life of Jesus, to his ministry, and then you go to the end of the Bible... And, uh, and we have this, this wedding feast in the book of Revelation in chapter 19. The wedding feast of the lamb, the bridegroom, and his bride. So not only has Jesus come, he's the master of the feast, but the best is yet to come. He's the king of kings, he's the master of the house, and he's come to make everything right. So he's the master of the feast, but then secondly, he's the bridegroom. He's... He's the bridegroom. And I wonder what it was like for him to be at, at a wedding. Because Jesus is 30 years old, about 30 at this point. His ministry lasted about three years, and we, we think he was crucified at age 33. And uh, I can still kind of remember when I was in my late teens and early 20s, you know, going to weddings and wondering if I might, you know, one day walk the aisle or wait for my wife to walk the aisle. Yeah, you, sometimes you wonder if you'll meet the right person. And um, what's going on in Jesus' mind as he attends this wedding as a 30-year-old 
bachelor. It's very old in those days, more normal these days, but very old in those days to still be unmarried. unmarried. And Jesus was truly human and uh, unspoiled with sin. He had, you know, normal human desires. And yet that was not his, his role. That was not to be his future as brother after brother and friend after friend met somebody and got married, just like this couple here in Cana. There's something different about Jesus, something different about his purpose in life, something different about why he was here. I think Mary already knows that he's special. She, of course, had a front row seat to his birth and knows he's something different because, of course, it was a virgin birth, has seen him every step along the way, knew how different he was without sin. And there's this give and take with Mary where Jesus' mother first notices that the wine is gone in verse 3 and, and comes to Jesus and, and, uh, and, and knows that he's special, he has special powers and tells them they have no more wine. And there's this, this display, we could probably translate this more dear, dear woman. I think it sounds a little abrupt in our text. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Uh, my hour has not yet come. And, and the Mary responds by still looking at the servant and saying, do whatever he tells you. I don't know what's going on here, but do what he tells you. And it's kind of puzzled me over the years why Jesus goes and, and still does the miracle. In a sense, he kind of rebukes Mary. Like, really, is, is my role to produce wine at, at a wedding? Perhaps he's already done some more private miracles, and she knows that he has this kind of power. But her, her understanding of why Jesus has come is very limited at this point, so... I mean, really, Mary, you want me to, to save this wedding producing wine? This seems like a small problem, not in keeping with the grandness of my mission. And yet, yet he does it. He turns that 150 gallons or so of, wine, of water into, into wine. The reason I think he does that, and we know the big reason, he's displaying his glory and his disciples believe in him, but I think in Jesus' heart, we get a, a little insight into Jesus' heart here. He's at a wedding. He's not without emotion or feeling. He has normal human desire. And there's something within Jesus' heart that awakens at a wedding to the reason for which he's come. The, the symbolism, the joy, the smile on everyone's face, the anticipation of, of the, the bride and the groom you know, at, at, at weddings, even, even the toughest guys sometimes can find, find themselves emotional, right? And it's, a, it's a, grand, a grand affair. And he knows the picture in the Old Testament of the one who will come, not just being Messiah, a teacher and a savior, but a bridegroom for God's people, for the bride that he loves. I think we see something into Jesus' heart here where he's moved by what happens at a wedding. Move to the point where, where he recalls and, and the, the, the sense of expectation of why he's come to die for the bride, to be the bridegroom that gives his life for the bride. We, we, get, a, we get an insight into his heart here, just how big his heart is towards, towards his people, towards those he's come to give his life for. In John, a little later on, John 3, verse 28, uh, people ask John the Baptist what he what he thinks about everyone going after Jesus. Because John the Baptist was really popular, an incredibly popular prophet, baptizing all sorts of people down by the Jordan River. And, uh, and he's becoming lesser as, as Jesus is, is uh, his ministry is exploding. John's ministry starts to decline. And he responds to that question, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom himself who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. I mentioned Revelation 19 as well. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And I think all of that, that big calling to be the bridegroom, to be the one that loves sinners, loves all of these failed human beings, including us here this afternoon, he's moved by his calling. He's moved by what he needs to do in order to make for himself a bride and in order to have that marriage feast sometime in the future. And I think that's flooding his heart. I think he's getting emotional. I think he's realizing deep, even more deeply what it will take, what his father has sent him to accomplish. And, um, and, and as part of Jesus stepping forward, willing to be the bridegroom who, who gives his life for his bride. That's how in love with his bride he is. And how glad he was to contemplate and to think on the fact he was going to willingly give his life away. I've come not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And um, every year of Jesus' ministry, I'm stepping forward into that role willingly. And it's because of the depth of his love. And I think at the wedding, he's that love is reviving in a, in a particularly strong way. So that his, the gift of his life will not be half-hearted, it will be full-throated love, full-hearted love for, for his people. And I don't think it's anything answers our heart's desire and our heart's need, but to know just how deeply committed to his bride, our Lord Jesus Christ, was. And uh, he chooses at this wedding, at this place of human celebration, to celebrate what he has come to accomplish and to give his life away. You're in this very intimate setting, this celebratory setting, this place where you, the wine keeps on flowing because the celebration is so great. He goes out of his way. He provides the wine, not because Mary asked him to, not because the master of the house and the bridegroom are going to be embarrassed, but to further demonstrate his glory. And, and, and this, this glory is not just the power to change water into, into wine, but the power and the intensity of his love. He's going to go forward with this, no matter what it costs him. And the cost, of course, is his very blood. And wine looks... Looks a lot like blood. Now, wine symbolizes blood. And every time he, uh, he saw someone ri- raising their glass, it was a reminder that he would have to pour out his blood so that they would be saved. He'll say later, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many to remission of sins. And uh, he said to his disciples at one point in the upper room before his, his, uh, his trial and crucifixion, I will, ne- I will not taste of the fruit of the vine with you again until we drink it together in my Father's kingdom. This is someone who knows the cost. It's someone who is feeling the weight of what he will have to do. But someone who is also joyfully fulfilling his Father's, his father's will. Now, Jesus says to Mary in verse 4, did you notice that my hour has not yet come? And if there's any scholars here, or or just those of you that have read through the Gospels a lot or heard enough sermons on it, that phrase might might kind of tweak something in your brain. Because pretty much every time that Jesus uses that phrase, my hour has not yet come, he's talking about his death. He's talking about his his coming passion, suffering associated with with his passion, all all the different aspects of of his rejection, of Judas betraying him, of Peter denying him, of the disciples scattering, of all of the lies at his trial, every level of power condemning him, everyone knowing he's innocent but condemning him anyways you know, nailed to a cross between two thieves, like the worst kind of, of criminal. His own people, you know, yelling for him to be crucified. People 
mocking him. You know, he could save others, he can't save himself. That's what's wrapped up in my hour has not yet come. The hour of his death. He knows what that hour is all about. It's about winning his bride, saving his bride, renewing his bride, delivering them from sin. And he feels that hour now. The only way that there's going to be wine at that wedding feast in the future, in the new heavens and the new earth, is if I spill my blood now. That's the only way. I I think he deliberately chooses these um, jars full of ceremonial uh, water. There's a lot of washings back then when you would wash your hands. Not not just because of the dirt that you might... uh, carried into a wedding, but also was a a bigger sign of the sin that cleaves to us. And uh, it's a demonstration that that water, which could never wash away sin, and all of those Old Testament ceremonies that could never deal with sin, he's going to deal with it with his own blood, like the redness of, of that wine. He's going to brace his bride, and he's going to give give his bride the feast that will last forever. This wine is the covenant in my blood. I just want to say here, as as we get close to our conclusion um, from this text here, this afternoon, you you think about the thrill of Jesus to give his life away, but also the realization of the cost. I just want to encourage you how much this can fuel your faith this coming week. As all of us desperately need our faith to be bolstered because we're going to be faced with all kinds of trials and all kinds of temptations this week again. And this can really, let me encourage you, fuel your faith to, to give this insight into the heart of Jesus Christ, how he thinks about you and me. As he knows this hour of darkness is coming, is approaching. And when so few people knew who he was and trusted in him and celebrated him, how much he was glad to give his life away and how much he was willing to give his life away. I know when uh, when we have a wedding, I've been at a wedding a, a number of times in this building. Actually, I was married in this building. And... We stand up right when the music starts. We stand up when the bride is about to come and we turn towards the bride. And that's the right thing to do. But I, I always make it a practice of taking a glance at the groom because I, I like to see his face when his bride appears and starts to walk down. And um, I've seen a mixture of smiles and delight Tears of, ha- of happiness um, as the bride comes down. And I want to encourage you this week to keep your eyes on, on the bridegroom. You know, glance often this week at the bridegroom. And remember that uh, many, many years ago, he experienced an outpouring of emotion and feeling, joy, as he was thinking about you thinking about his bride throughout every generation, what he would have to give up, the blood he would have to shed. And he willingly revealed his glory. His disciples believed in him. And you too can believe in him and trust him because of who he's shown himself to be. What a faithful savior and bridegroom. And and you can be sure that not only is, is your present secure, but your future is secure because the one who saved this wedding... This, this small picture of what's coming uh, is going gonna to finish the job. It's going to be this wedding feast. Keep your eye on, on the groom. Let me just end with two thoughts. Uh, first of all, make sure you're at that wedding feast. I want to encourage you to think this week, if you don't yet know the Lord Jesus Christ, to think about who he is, what he said about himself. Take a look through the Gospels. Listen to what Jesus said. Look at what he does. And ask yourself if he just might be the Savior of the world.
the way, the truth, and the life, the only hope for lost mankind, for you as a lost sinner. Make sure you are at that wedding feast to end all wedding feasts. And, uh, and go to God and plead on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done, his credit, um, his righteousness, his sacrifice on your behalf. Give up everything you've done that gives your life meaning and purpose and identity and throw yourself on the Heavenly Father's favor and ask him to look at Jesus in your place. And then finally, I like what Mary says in verse 5. That kind of sticks with me. His mother said to the servants, even after Jesus kind of mildly rebukes her, do whatever he tells you. A couple things about Mary here. I was recently uh, overseas in Europe, and we spent a lot of our time, if you've ever been over there, going to a lot of old churches and a bunch of museums. And, uh, and I enjoyed that, don't get me wrong, but it does always app- appall me somewhat that often there's as many uh, paintings of saints and Mary in particular as there are of, of Jesus and the, gospel, and the gospel stories. So the... Uh, the Catholic Church in particular, has gone in that, in that direction. But we can't lose sight of the fact of the importance of Mary. She's an important character in, in John chapter 2 and throughout Jesus, Jesus' life. She's one of the first ones that came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we can learn a lot from her example. I would say just a couple things in including here. She tells the servants to do whatever he says. And she's come to believe that Jesus is not just Savior, whatever that means for her at that point, but he is Lord. And I want to encourage you this week to do whatever Jesus said. Find out what he says in his word. And uh, he is the right, more than anybody else, to claim your loyalty. So be loyal to King Jesus this coming week. He's the one who gave his life. He's the one who is exalted as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then finally, do what Mary does. I think we we get that picture in Luke chapter 2, but throughout her life, Mary is the one, she's the character who's watching everything. And she's, as we see in Luke 2, she ponders these things. She keeps them in her heart. And uh, and, and she turns from unbelief to belief. She's one of the first followers of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these things that we've learned from God's word, ponder them, meditate on them, and and keep these things like Mary did. Treasure them in in your hearts. Everything you've learned from God's word and everything you read about Jesus this week, spend time in God's word. And and ponder them and treasure them more than anything else you're going to read or see or think about. He's the master of the feast. And he's the true bridegroom, and he's coming back. And one day, uh, we and people from all tribes and tongues and nations will enjoy that wedding feast in the new heavens and new earth. Uh, May may the Lord uh, continue to direct us, and may we consider him faithful as we continue our journey towards that wedding feast. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Gospel of John and the way that, in addition to the the three other Gospel writers, uh, John has this perspective under the power of your Holy Spirit to really uh, move us towards seeing the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, recording some of his long prayers Recording, in particular, the last week of his life, the passion, his suffering, the, the internal struggle within his, within his heart and his mind, and just showing us Jesus Christ, true man and true God, this great mystery. And uh, thank you for this scene at this wedding feast, and we pray that our hearts might more fully see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and believe in him, that our faith would grow, that our faith would 
we get stronger and cling to Jesus Christ. Through all the darkness of this world in our own hearts, through all of our choices and deliberations this week, all of our wanderings and all of our responsibilities, keep us tethered uh, to the Lord Jesus. Keep us tethered to his heart, and his heart that is full of compassion and full of this willingness to be the, the one who sacrifices for the sake of, of his bride. And it's, it's wonderful biblical language that we are the bride and that our bridegroom is uh, willingly giving his life for the bride, for the church, full of, full of uh, unworthy sinners like us. Just praise your name and thank you in, in your son's name. Amen. Amen.